Hello, my excellent biologists. I am Mrs. Sloan, and today we're going to talk about hormones and the endocrine system. And for my class, this would be chapter 40. And we're using this as an illustrative example in the cell signaling unit four for AP biology. So let me make myself a little bit smaller and get in presentation mode. And while I'm doing that, I want to remind you that I have notes available down in the descriptor um, below and my students fill in the notes um, as I go along and I will help you with that process. Um, and then the second column is for you to add in pictures or diagrams that are supportive, um, maybe screenshots from this presentation or you can Google some additional pictures to help you out. All right, so um, part one we're gonna talk about is just compare and contrast the endocrine system with the nervous system. So first of all, when you think about the endocrine system, um, sometimes we just think of some particular glands that we know about, like the pancreas or the pituitary gland. But I want to remind you that it includes things like the heart, right, and the stomach, because all um, those glands, or sorry, those organs also secrete hormones as well. So the whole purpose of the endocrine system is to coordinate the activities of the body along with the nervous system. So both of these systems are um, critical to that process. So on your notes down in the introduction, hormones defined, I want us to put in there chemicals that affect the behavior of other glands or tissues. Chemicals that affect the behavior of other glands or tissues. All right, so when we talk about glands, um, we talk about exocrine glands versus endocrine glands. and what the endocrine glands secrete are hormones. So let's talk about what hormones influence, and this is also in your notes. Hormones influence the metabolism of cells, growth and development of body parts, and homeostasis. Metabolism of cells, growth and development of body parts, and homeostasis. So glands can be categorized as exocrine, or endocrine glands. And here's the deal on that. An exocrine gland is going to secrete its product into some sort of duct or tube. And you could think of like a sweat gland or a salivary gland, that's an exocrine gland. What an endocrine gland is gonna do is secrete its products into the blood, okay? Now, when we talk about the different types of signaling like paracrine signaling or endocrine signaling, endocrine signaling means you're gonna affect something at some distance, some distant target within our body, okay? So the way we do that is we put that chemical, that hormone into our blood and it's gonna travel through our blood to that distant target. So on your notes, for endocrine glands, you wanna have secrete hormones into the bloodstream via tissue fluid, not ducts. Whereas exocrine glands secrete their products into ducts, which they take them into lumens of other organs or maybe outside the body. Okay, and then I gave you an example for that of the salivary glands. So um, comparing and contrasting um, nervous and endocrine system, what you're seeing right over here on the left is an example of where you have some cell, some endocrine cell, maybe part of a system, secreting its components into the blood and it's that blood is right going everywhere in the body but the only cells that it influences are those cells that have receptors for that particular hormone at that distant location whereas when we look at examples of neurons this is more in the umbrella of paracrine signaling where it only travels a short distance so this would be the other extreme all the way to the other side where this, you have some sort of neurotransmitter like acetylcholine or epinephrine, and it's getting released by a neuron at the synaptic cleft. It's this tiny, tiny little space that this chemical has to, to um, tra um, travel from this, from neuron one to neuron two to affect its target cell. Now, there are also um, examples, and we're gonna talk about this when we talk about the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, where you have this in-between. So it's, it's not like over here, like 
and exactly like an endocrine cell. It's not exactly like a neuron, but these are neurosecretory cells that can release a hormone to travel to a target cell, but it acts like a neuron in its behavior. And so I'll give you some examples of that as well. So as far as comparing and contrasting, if you were thinking just intuitively, what do you think is faster? Here over on the left with hormones or over here on the right with neurons in your nervous system? And hopefully you're saying your nervous system um, is going to work a lot more quickly, right, than an endocrine system. But conversely, the impact of the endocrine system um, is very long lasting when you think what it influences like growth and development and homeostasis. So um, hormones and homeostasis, um, compared to the nervous system, it acts more slowly, it acts more slowly, but the effect is longer lasting, but the effect is longer lasting. Okay, so here's another example of some signaling, and you'll be doing a pogol that relates to this already. But look at this paracrine signaling. So it's just impacting the neighboring cells here. Okay, here's a synapse between two neurons. So this is very short distance, whereas when you have endocrine signaling, it's over a longer distance, right? Because it could be something from your pituitary gland that's impacting something at your like your gonads or something like that. All right, so if we were in class, I'd have you ping pong back and forth with your partner, but just take a minute, that's what the slate in the blue is, those are chairs in my classroom. If you just compare and contrast what they're composed of, right? Neurons versus glands usually, right? And then what is the delivery system? So you're using a neurotransmitter in the nervous system versus a hormone in the endocrine system, how it's delivered, a synapse versus the bloodstream, what the target is. It's kind of crazy to think about, but your nervous system can only impact two things, right? Muscles and glands. So what can it get a muscle to do? Contract that it can make a muscle contract and it can make a gland secrete. So those are your targets for your entire nervous system. Um, where the target for the endocrine system is cells throughout your body, nervous is very rapid, endocrine system slow and long lasting. They can both be controlled by negative feedback and we'll talk about some other feedback systems as well. So that brings us to part two, control and feedback loops. So take a look right here on positive and negative feedback a lot of times like in our heads we're like oh that was positive feedback because you gave me something encouraging and negative feedback is something that hurt my feelings it's it's not like that when we talk about it in the in the body so don't think good and bad um, of these two positive and negative feedback negative feedback is very prevalent in our bodies. positive feedback is limited in its situations because what positive feedback does is it amps up the response whatever stimulus is causing a positive feedback it's exaggerating the response which makes you have more stimulus which exaggerates it so it doesn't keep it level it amplifies the response whereas negative feedback is more about um, about getting the the body back to a steady state I should have made myself bigger about getting back to a steady state and the example i usually give with my students would be let me tell you about positive feedback let's say you've got an argument with your parents so you argue and now they're really upset so they start yelling a little bit louder and now you're upset so you argue some more and then they yell even louder and then it goes to some climactic event of yelling and doors slamming okay Hopefully it's not like that, but I'm sure we all have examples like that. So it exaggerates, exaggerates to some climactic event. Your good example there where you would see this biologically is during birth, right? Because as the uterus contracts, and I'll show you some pictures of this, as the uterus contracts, it pushes the baby against the cervix, which then goes back to your nervous system saying contract more so it pushes the baby even harder against the cervix and says contract more and this continues until you have this climactic event of a baby being born whereas negative feedback a classic example for that would be like if you set the cruise control in your car right because if you set it at like 65 miles an hour if your car starts going downhill and you start picking up speed 
brakes are applied, right? If you're going uphill and you're starting to slow down, then more fuel is given to your car and you start to speed up. So you're, you're trying to keep it right at 65 miles an hour. Now in our body, you could think of like blood sugar. So we need a certain level of glucose in our bloodstream. If it gets too low, glucagon can be secreted by your pancreas, which will elevate it. If your glucose level gets too high, insulin will bring it back down. That would be an example of negative feedback. I'll give you a few more too. So hopefully that paints a picture for you. And let's take a look at these next few slides, okay? So let's take a look at here at temperature. So here's the stim stimulus. Your body temperature rises. Let's say you're working out or hiking or something, so your temperature goes up. So you have receptors that realize your temperature is up. And so it's going to get mechanisms in play to cool your body back down. So your blood vessels are gonna dilate, maybe in your face it starts to get red and flushed, and that's because your blood's trying to cool itself and it's trying to get it back to the correct temperature, or maybe you will sweat, and then you'll get your temperature back to normal. That would be an example of negative feedback. Okay, here with positive feedback, like I mentioned earlier, when the your uterus contracts, if you've got one, it pushes the baby's head against that cervix. So now the cervix detects that and it sends impulses back to your brain and your pituitary gland will secrete oxytocin and oxytocin carried by your bloodstream to the targets at your uterus will make the uterus contract even more, and this will continue and continue until that baby comes out. All right, and then I have a little TikTok right here. I will show you actually on a smart board what I mean by that. Hopefully this will work. Let's see. So homeostasis, you have two systems that contribute to it the most, the nervous system and the endocrine system. Which one do you think is faster? Nervous. The nervous system, yeah. Endocrine system can be fast with like fight or flight, but all organs help contribute to that. Second, I wanna remind you about feedback. When you have negative feedback, that's when you're trying to stay the course. For instance, if your glucose levels go up, insulin will lower it. If your glucose levels go down too far, glucagon will help raise it. So you're trying to maintain that glucose level. Whereas positive feedback, if you're gonna have a baby later, not now, if you are gonna have a baby, what happens is you will start to secrete oxytocin, oxytocin, will help contract your uterus, which pushes the baby's head against the cervix, which makes it secrete even more oxytocin until the baby comes out. Yay. Okay, so I wanted you to see that so you could see the difference, right? You're trying to stay level at negative feedback, whereas in positive feedback, it's going up and up and up. So on your notes, on feedback loops, um, for negative uh, feedback, there are many examples for that. The level of the hormone itself or of some chemical induced by that hormone um, will inhibit the further secretion of that hormone so it gets it back in control, okay, or at that level. And then with positive feedback, there are fewer examples and the output intensifies and increases the output of that system. All right, so the next one I wanna show you are um, antagonistic hormones. Let me move over here. So antagonistic hormones, um, and, and I showed you this as an example of negative feedback as well, but this is kind of an example of that. Um, your pancreas, right? Um, you have these areas of your pancreas called the islets of Langerhans, and those cells, the alpha and beta cells of the islets of Langerhans are in charge of either you're going to be secreting either insulin or glucagon. Now, side note about the pancreas, it's also a critical organ in digestion. So not only does it act as an endocrine gland with insulin and glucagon, but it also acts as an exocrine gland secreting digestive enzymes into your small intestine. All right. So here, if we look at the blood sugar levels and they're coming in too low, Glucagon is released by the alpha cells, and those will then um, increase the, the glucose level to get it back to what your body needs. Contrary to that, if the blood glucose coming in, or if the blood coming into the pancreas is too high in glucose, then you'll have insulin released, 
And so fat cells will take up the glucose from the blood so that you have the normal blood glucose levels. So antagonistic hormones working together to maintain homeostasis through negative feedback, they are contrary. So antagonistic hormones, they are contrary. Hormones that have opposite effect. Hormones that have opposite effects. Now, what happens when things go wrong? So if you are secreting too much of a hormone, like say hyperthyroidism, right? That is a hyper secretion if you're secreting too much. And then hypo, hypo means low, hypo secretion is too little. So on your notes, hyper secretion is too much, hypo secretion um, is too little. All right. Next topic, cell signaling. So let's look at some different strategies in cell signaling. So first of all, just a little review here. Hormones are chemical signals and they are carried by the bloodstream. And it's only at the capillary levels where you're gonna have any exchange between blood and tissue fluid. And that's another whole discussion about how the fluid gets out of the blood. But for right now, we wanna just know um, the hydrostatic pressure pushing fluids out of your bloodstream is greater than the osmotic pressure drawing fluids into your bloodstream at the arterial end of a capillary bed. So hormones are moved out into the interstitial fluid, into the, the extracellular fluid around your cells. Those hormones, you can see right here, you have these cells right here. Look at their receptors. I know this is just a simple diagram, but look at their receptors. The hormone will not fit into that receptor, so it will not influence the behavior of this cell, but it will influence the behavior of the target cell. Remember, cells are blind. The only way one cell can communicate with another cell is directly cell to cell in some way, right? It can influence it, like, um, or it sends a chemical message and the cell receives that. Now, in this case, your receptor is right here on the edge of the cell membrane, right? But if it's a steroid hormone, your receptor could be to the interior of the cell itself. So um, on hormones and chemical signals in your notes, it can only impact those target cells that have, that have protein receptors for that hormone that have protein receptors for that hormone. And that receptor, like I said, could be on the cell membrane or internally inside the cell. All right, let's look at some more examples here. Let's compare and contrast pheromones in animals with hormones in animals, all right? So you, you can see here the hormones, right? Getting secreted, oh, sorry, over here, by your secreting cell traveling through the the blood and impacting the target cell, where here this female deer is secreting a pheromone and it's affecting the male deer. So pheromones are what you find where it's between two different organisms entirely, whereas hormones are between two different body parts in a single organism. All right, so on your um, pheromones, chemical signals that act between individuals. Chemical signals that act between individuals, and this is important um, in many different animal species, obviously, and that would be another whole discussion. All right, so I wanna give you some more examples. This is kind of interesting. Um, on, I, I don't actually, yes, I have this underneath your examples as number three, and, um, women, when they cry, that the, the pheromones that we have within our tears, um, that impacts the testosterone level of the men within our presence. So that, that I think is a pretty interesting, and I have that in your, in your notes. And the way they did this is they had women cry into like jars and then males smelled the jars of tears versus I guess a saline solution. And then they measured their testosterone level. Um, also, another example here is where one female's menstrual cycle can impact the menstrual cycle of another female. Um, and so I have that down there as an example. And then the last one um, that I had, and I don't think, oh, there are the tears, sorry. That was the tears example, I did them out of order. Um, so let me go back to this other side where I should have started, so sorry. Um, what you're attracted to, what they've done some studies about females and how they're attracted to males, is you have 
if you remember from our um, functions of proteins and cell membranes, remember we said there was channels and carriers, cell recognition, right? We have MHCs, uh, major histocompatibility complexes that are part of our immune system. And females are attracted to males that have ones that are different from our own MHCs. And the idea there is that we would be attracted to males that it can increase the variety, the genetic diversity of our offspring. And that's who we would mate with. And they've done some studies with that and t-shirts and things like that, that you might find interesting. Okay. So there's that one. And then the menstrual cycles and then the tears. So those are underneath the umbrella there of pheromones acting at a distance on another organism. All right. Um, next, hormones work differently. And I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, the When we talk about the first example where you have a receptor right here at the phospholipid bilayer, that's because this hormone, this cell signal that is getting um, targeted here, it is water soluble. And remember when we talked about how you cross through a cell membrane, you can't do it if you are large or charged, right? You're not going to be able to pass through. But also remember our discussion about this region of the cell membrane and how the center region is hydrophobic, right? Because our phospholipids are amphipathic, which means they have two different regions to them, a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic region. So due to the hydrophobic region of those phospholipids, water soluble can molecules cannot pass through. So they just bind to a receptor. Now, when this receptor is triggered by that hormone, it can trigger what you would call as a signal transduction pathway. It can set off a chain of events that will eventually influence the behavior of the cell. And this could be a secondary messenger um, that triggers the behavior of the cell, either a cytoplasmic response, like maybe making glucose available to that cell or ultimately affecting gene regulation. Okay, so what happens is that hormone stands at the door and knocks, but triggers a behavior inside that cell. Whereas a lipid cellular hormone, any of those that are steroid based hormones, and that would be um, those hormones secreted from your gonads. So it could be estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, or your adrenal gland, which sits on top of your kidney. You have an adrenal cortex on the outside of the, of the adrenal gland and the adrenal medulla inside. The adrenal cortex hormones, glucocorticoids, mineral corticoids, and cortical sex hormones, those are also steroid hormones. They have the ability, because it's lipid into lipid, to cross right through the phospholipid bilayer because they are not large and they are not charged in any way. And they bind to a receptor inside the cell and these will influence gene regulation. So on your notes, um, on the action of hormones, I have two categories, peptoid, peptide hormones that are water soluble, and those will trigger second messengers, okay? Peptide hormones, water soluble, and second messengers. And then down below that number two, steroid hormones, lipid soluble, and they affect gene expression. And then I want to go into a few more details on each of those. So let's take a look here. An example, and this is your classic example. I want you to be very familiar with it. Here you have the hormone epinephrine. Epinephrine, another name for that is adrenaline. And remember how I talked about the adrenal gland, that there was the adrenal cortex, and in the center of that is the adrenal medulla. The adrenal medulla secretes um, epinephrine and norepinephrine. Epinephrine has to do with fight or flight, right, in the immediate, like, am I going to run away because I'm scared or am I going to fight you? And noradrenaline is anger. So that would be like if you got surprised and then you were mad at somebody for surprising you, That that's a good way to think of those. When epinephrine is released, okay, and it binds to a receptor because it's water soluble, it then triggers what's called the G protein, neighboring it in the cell membrane, okay? Ultimately, what that's going to do is you're going to activate adenylate cyclase, which will then trigger ATP to become cyclic AMP. So remember ATP, ADP, this is AMP. So it's down to 
um, just like what you think of ATP, but just one phosphate group. And in order to make all the bonds happy, it's actually cyclic. And I'll show you a picture of that, okay? But cyclic AMP is known as what's the second messenger that can influence the behavior of the cell. The first messenger would have been the epinephrine. So if you look at your notes underneath um, the action of hormones, number one, peptide hormones, you have um, letter B, binding triggers a second messenger. This would be your second messenger right here, which triggers a metabolic cascade of events. And underneath that under example, epinephrine binds to a receptor protein in the target cell's plasma membrane. So that's going right here. The binding leads to the activation of the G protein here that activates another adenylate cyclase that changes ATP right here to cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP is the second messenger. And let me show you what that triggers, okay? So here's just another diagram. Get your bearings, okay? Just shows you a little bit more. Here's your epinephrine. Here's your receptor. Here's your G protein, which is going to, through GTP, activate adenylate cyclase. Adenylate cyclase is going to convert ATP to cyclic AMP. And this is your second messenger, which starts this protein kinase, this enzyme, triggers like a domino effect, which ultimately makes glucose available to the cell. Okay? Leveling up one more time. Okay? Trying to work you into this. Here's your adrenaline again, start here in the top left-hand corner, right? And here you can see the receptor for that. And eventually what you're getting right here, you, you can see activated adenylate cyclase, okay? Because your ATP right here is becoming cyclic AMP. This is triggering a metabolic pathway. Remember how we have one enzyme triggers one reactant to become a product and then that will trigger the next and so forth. So you have this whole sequence of events, but ultimately you're making glucose available to that cell and it's affecting the metabolism. All right, so on your notes, the last part, number four, CAMP activates an enzyme cascade that ultimately leads to glycogen breaking down into glucose and becoming available to cells. Now, let's take a look at another example of this, now side by side. Okay, so just get your bearings again, hormone, receptor, activation, ATP becoming cyclic AMP, this activates this whole enzyme cascade. Here's glycogen getting broken down into glucose. Okay, now let's contrast this to steroid hormones. This, this is a, on the left, this is quick, this is a little bit slower. So here you have a lipid soluble hormone, right? Some sort of steroid. Notice it's coming all the way right through the phospholipid bilayer. It's even going through the nuclear envelope. It's binding to a receptor inside the nucleus, which then is triggering, um, and we'll talk about control of gene expression, but it's activating the transcription of this DNA into mRNA. Then this mRNA could leave and go on to a ribosome, potentially on the endoplasmic reticulum, protein is then made. Now, you know, it's by, you know, it's, it's not showing you all the steps of where it goes through the ER and then to the Golgi apparatus, but it's just showing you that you would have um, amplification of a certain gene and that protein product. That's going to take a little bit more time because you're actually synthesizing a protein. Whereas over here on the left, these are a little bit quicker. And this is the majority of your hormones where you're just activating and getting glucose available to the cell. So on your steroid hormone, lipid soluble and gene expression, the hormone diffuses through the plasma membrane um, and diffuses through the plasma membrane, lipids dissolve into lipids. It binds to an intracellular receptor and goes into the nucleus. The hormone receptor complex acts as a transcription factor. Transcription factors facilitate gene expression and it activates a gene and ultimately a protein is formed and ultimately a protein is formed. And examples are um, hormones from the adrenal cortex, ovaries and testes. All right. So now the next part, and by the way, you're doing a great job, okay? I want to just introduce um, a few um, other examples of cell signaling to you so you can see that under that, that bigger umbrella. So these are 
three types of receptors, okay? A chemoreceptor for a chemical, a mechanoreceptor for like movement, and photoreceptors. So take a look right here. Here you have your chemical signal, and I just want you to see um, the commonalities between all of them and the signal transduction pathway. So here your chemical stimulus binds to the receptor, it opens up an ion channel, changes the membrane potential, and it goes to its signaling center. Here is a pressure receptor. Still opens up an ion channel, and then this goes to the signaling receptor, in your, uh, it, signal in, um, integrating um, center in your brain. Sorry, stall. Here is like could be in your eyes. You could have a photoreceptor again with this ion channel. This, if you look at the similarities here, these ion channels, when they're allowed to come in, this would be like an example of a second messenger similar into what we're seeing here in our um, protein hormones, okay? Let's look at taste real quick, okay? It used to be that there were certain areas they used to think of your tongue where you tasted sweet and sour and bitter, and now they know it's scattered all over your tongue, um, and there's this fifth taste called umami that we have receptors for, and again, it's the same, um, same system. So for instance, between tasting salt and sour, right? And this, what you see right here with a salty taste where you have extra sodium, right? Salt, the sodium comes in, which allows calcium to come in. And you could think of calcium as a second messenger, which then triggers this taste receptor to trigger a neuron. Here, when you're doing sour, Okay, the sour flavor, this hydrogen ion is now blocking this potassium channel. So potassium is building up. It's not going out of the cell, which then triggers the same exact system, calcium to come in as if a second messenger. So whether we're talking about how we trigger our neurons or how glands are triggered, you can see this commonality in this process through cell signaling. So on this one, Though we are talking in this chapter primarily about the endocrine system, I want you to see the similar patterns even in our nervous system and how neurons are triggered. Um, if you look here, and I, yeah, I just clipped this out of uh, one of my uh, Scientific Americans here. I wanted you to see that taste receptors are not limited to your mouth. We actually have sweet and bitter receptors all over our body. And what they have come to find out is that we can actually taste bacteria in our body or the toxins that they make, and we can use that as a defensive mechanisms in our body. All right, I didn't have notes on those. I just wanted you to see those similar patterns. Um, part three, I'm gonna talk about specific glands and hormones um, and what they secrete and how they influence our body. But I think that uh, this part right here is good for um, now. All right, hope you're having a great day.